frustration. Although the law may be described as frustrating for many reasons, the term frustration has a particular meaning in the law of contract. Rather than a sense of being bothered by something, frustration is the situation where an uncontrollable, unforeseen impossibility arises. A situation in which a party to a contract simply cannot perform their obligations under it because of a change of circumstances arising from a situation outside their control after they entered into the contract. Although there are different views as to the true basis of frustration in law, a good way of thinking about it is to consider that it discharges a contract because the nature of the agreement is so fundamentally different and that that different agreement is not what the parties had agreed to perform. I will talk about three of the possible bases of frustration, impossibility, illegality and the non-occurrence of a critical event. I will then turn to talk about the situations in which a party cannot rely on frustration, the effects of frustration on a contract, and alternatives to reliance on the common law of frustration. The first of the three possible bases then of frustration is that of impossibility, and a contract may be frustrated where performance is rendered impossible. For example, in the case of Taylor and Caldwell, the defendant's concert halls were destroyed by a fire. The claimant tried to obtain damages for breach of contract, but the court held that the contract was frustrated by the incident, which was the fault of neither party. Caldwell simply could not perform because their concert hall had been burnt down, and that made their performance impossible. Similarly, where a particular individual is critical to the performance of a contract, their prolonged, or potentially prolonged, uncontrolled absence may frustrate it. See the case of Morgan and Mansa. The second basis of frustration is that of illegality, and this is the circumstance in which a change of law renders performance or further performance of the contract illegal. See the case of Fibrosa and Fairburn Lawson Coombe Barber. However, where a change of law merely requires a party to perform the service in a slightly different manner, frustration is unlikely. There is a lawful way of performing the contract and performance remains possible, even if it wasn't quite the mechanism of performance that the parties had envisaged. The third basis is non-occurrence of a critical event. Where a contract is entered into on the basis of a future event happening, the failure of that event to happen may amount to frustration of the contract. There are two particular cases to consider here, and they're not easy to reconcile. The first case is that of Krell and Henry, in which the defendant, Henry, agreed to hire an apartment overlooking a particular street in London, so that he might view the procession of the King's coronation. The contract did not say anything specific about the coronation, but provided only for daytime use on the relevant days in question. When the coronation was cancelled, the defendant refused to pay the balance which he owed. The Court of Appeal held that the claimant was not entitled to the remainder of the money previously owed, since the cancellation of the contract frustrated sorry, the cancellation of the coronation frustrated the contract. The coronation was the foundation of the contract, even though it was never mentioned in it. The second case is Hearn Bay and Hutton. In this case, the defendant chartered a boat, with the contract stating that the hire was for the viewing of the naval review and for a day's cruising around the fleet. The review was cancelled as the king was unwell, and the claimant sued for unpaid sums of money, and won. The court held that the contract was not frustrated by the review not going ahead. Why the, why the difference? Well, in Hearn Bay, the court held that the contract had two parts, and that while the review was cancelled, the day's cruising around the fleet was entirely unaffected. Another of the judges considered that the contract was simply a question of hiring a boat and if the party that hired the boat had a particular reason for doing so, that was their problem, 
rather than the boat owners. Although these distinctions are not substantial, perhaps they are great enough to justify a different treatment. A second point on which to ponder is perhaps that if an event is the one central reason for you entering into a contract, it might be advisable to make sure that this is clearly spelled out in the contract itself, such that a failure of the event to happen justifies treatment as frustration, although, as I will come on to discuss later, there is an altogether better way of handling this through what's known as a force majeure clause. Frustration is not available in all situations, and I will talk through five circumstances in which a party is unable to claim that a contract has been frustrated. The first of these is that where a contract term expressly covers a particular situation, which in fact actually happens, the doctrine of frustration is not usually available. These are what are known as generally as force majeure clauses, which I will discuss a bit later. The courts tend to interpret a force majeure clause reasonably narrowly, and if you intend a clause to cover a massive upheaval, you would need to spell this out very clearly. See the case of Jackson and Union Marine Insurance. The second situation in which party cannot rely on frustration is where performance is just more onerous, where the event does not um, cause a radical change to the contractual situation, but simply requires a party to uh, perform in a slightly more onerous manner. Frustration is not available. Davis Contractors and Ferrum Urban District Council. For example, a situation in which a supplier's costs in fulfilling their obligations are more than they have predicted is unlikely to lead to frustration unless the impact renders the contract fundamentally different in nature. The third situation is where one of the parties causes the allegedly frustrating event. Thus, choosing to spend limited resources in a particular way, where you could have chosen to have spent them in a different way and avoid the frustrating event, the situation in maritime national thrish and ocean trawlers, is likely to mean that you cannot claim frustration since you had the choice as to how you would allocate your resources. Where the frustrating event was foreseeable, or could have been reasonably foreseen, frustration is not available as the parties should have dealt with it in the contract instead, uh, again Davis Contractors and Ferrum Urban District Council. Lastly, we have the notion of lack of common assumption, and the principle is that for frustration to apply, it must be a common assumption, an understanding that performance will happen in a particular way, which is fundamentally altered by the intervening act. Where only one party ever had a plan that the contract should be performed in a particular way, such as a supplier only envisaging that one supply route and only one supply route would be used, there is no frustration. But what is the effect of frustration on a contract? Frustration discharges the contract from the point at which the frustrating event occurs. Obligations and rights which arise before the frustrating event are unaffected, only those which relate to the period after the event are discharged. This can have some unfortunate results. Take, for example, the situation in which a buyer pays a seller in full for a particular instance of an old car, i.e. a particular car. But that night, the car is destroyed in an entirely unpredictable event. Since the seller's duty was to supply a specific car, and that car no longer exists, the contract is frustrated. It is terminated from that point onwards. However, as the obligation to pay arose before the frustrating event, the buyer could not recover their money. See the case of Chandler and Webster. This unfairness was purportedly addressed by the Law Reform Frustrated Contracts Act of 1943. Um, this has been criticised as a very poorly considered piece of legislation, and I would encourage you to take a look at it, if only to make sure that you disapply it um, in the contracts for which you are responsible. Many contracts today will attempt to work around the limits and weaknesses of the doctrine of frustration through what are generally known as force majeure clauses. In the Channel Island Ferries and Sea Link case, the contract contained a clause which read, a party shall not be liable 
in the event of non-fulfilment of any obligation arising under this contract, by reason of act of God, diseases, strikes, lockouts, fire, and any accident of any nature beyond the control of the relevant party. This is a reasonably standard construction of a force majeure clause, covering any accident or incident or any nature beyond the reasonable control of the relevant party, plus a list of examples. As a supplier, you will want to ensure that the clause covers realistically the risks that you will face. If, for example, your business is dependent on the operation of the train network in the UK, you may want to include within your force majeure clause a failure of the trains to operate, or severe weather which could lead to that. Unless specifically included within a force majeure clause, an event which simply makes a contract uneconomic to perform, such as an increase in energy prices, will not be treated as a force majeure event. See Thames Valley Power and Total Gas. You might prefer a force majeure clause over the common law of frustration for a number of reasons. First, a force majeure clause provides certainty, as it's likely to set out a list of events which operate as frustrating the contract. You might contrast this with the position under frustration, where there might be scope to argue whether or not the event frustrates the contract or not. Second, frustration, as we've discussed, is a relatively narrow doctrine designed to operate only for unforeseeable events entirely outside the control of the parties, whereas an agreement as to what constitutes force majeure puts control back in the hands of the parties as to what they wish to treat as such an event. Lastly, frustration operates to discharge the contract from the point at which the frustrating event happens. With a force majeure clause, the parties can decide for themselves how they wish the problem to be resolved, offering more options than just a simple discharge. I have included an article to, on force majeure, a link to the article, published by the Society for Computers and Law, for those of you who have access. What then are the key points of frustration? The doctrine of frustration relates to the uncontrollable, unforeseeable impossibility in performing a contract. It arises when a party to a contract simply cannot perform their obligations under that contract because of a change of circumstances arising from a situation outside their control after they had entered into the contract. Three common bases for frustration are impossibility, illegality and non-occurrence of a critical event. Frustration will not arise, however, where the event is covered by the contract, performance is simply made more onerous but not impossible, where the event was caused by one of the parties, where the event was foreseeable, or where only one of the parties had an assumption that performance would take a particular form. Frustration discharges the contract from the point at which the frustrating event happens, and I would strongly suggest that you endeavour to handle potential frustrations within the contract in the form of a force majeure clause to ensure certainty and perhaps an equitability of outcome and to enable an appropriate allocation of risk.